Well, Zania, great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Sure. So, uh, look, we're here uh, to talk about marketing. We've been doing that a lot for the last couple of days, or day and a half or so. Uh, so I'd like to start this by talking a bit about the person, because I think far too often we dive into the tactics and the strategies and don't maybe spend as much time understanding maybe the people involved. So I'll share a bit about you, and then I'd like you to share what I haven't that might be relevant for the group. So if you don't know, Dania is, uh, has her undergrad from Stanford University. She was a varsity track and field. Uh, and even more than that, right? Varsity track and field, and it plays ball staff, you might have heard of it. Um, she has an MBA from a place that you guys might have heard of as well, Harvard Business School. Um, and that's just her academic piece. But if you think about kind of her career since that time, she was vice president of business development at WPP Digital, which means you can probably take my job. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> She was VP of Midlop Ultra for three years, and then VP of Consumer Connection, which is what you do now for the entire year of Coil, correct? That's correct, yes. So like that is a very uh, extensive career for someone so young. So I'd love to- Thank you for to... saying that I'm young. Here's <laughs> <laughs> the facts, uh, you are. So what I'd like to understand a bit is, what about those two or three bullet points that I just shared? What did I miss that's relevant to the features that are today? At Anheuser Busch. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I've been out of school a long time, so it's fun to say the fancy titles. But like, I, I always said to myself, I've, I've been, I graduated HBS in 2008, and I always said, and when I hit the 10 to 15 year mark, it's the most impressive thing about me is that I got into hard business school. I will, I would have failed right <laughs> in my career. Don't want to be one of those people. Um, so hopefully, I have, I have achieved uh, beyond that. Um, and I don't know, my, my career and my choices are, I, I think, two things. I am hyper curious. And so I have always selected roles and experiences that allowed me to grow and learn and do new things. Um, and I have always chosen managers and not roles. Um, and I think, you know, titles and things maybe have come at different, faster or slower speeds in, in different roles, depending on what was happening. Um, but I always have chosen people who I felt inspired by who I felt were committed to developing and, and building strong talent um, and who had ambitions of their own. If you have a boss who's peaked, where are you going? Ooh, that's a problem. Right? Um, and so just really thinking about, um, you know, where where to go and, and how to get there. So that makes perfect sense. We're going to dig in a bit later to kind of your management style, how you lead teams, how you build teams, because it's relevant for a role like yours and many of the roles of people that, uh, that are with us today. But I want to dig in a little bit before we get to, to that. And I want to understand how did you choose maybe marketing as a point of interest to you? And then maybe even why beer? Sure. Um, I, it's a little bit of a corny story. My, my father was a marketer in uh, CPG. He worked for Claire All and uh, Colgate Home All and Dark and Lovely and a bunch of others. And so I grew up um, walking the, the health and beauty aisle <laughs> of grocery stores everywhere and like counting facings of blonde hair dye and whatever else. And like we would fax him names of toothpaste things and stuff. And so I, it was sort of always um, in my blood. I actually started my career in nonprofit though, coming out of college, much to my parents' chagrin. They were like, we sent you to Stanford to go work for free. Um, and uh, decided I wanted to, I was doing marketing and events and I wanted kind of corporate training. Um, and I thought I would actually work, go back to nonprofit. And so many, many years later, I'm still on the corporate side um, and realizing because I actually feel like I can make as much difference on this side of the table as I could in the other. But I, I didn't know at the time that like me being in the rooms that I'm in offers me the ability to, to create change um, in a way that I just hadn't hadn't envisioned before. Um, so, yeah, so mark, marketer by training found my way to, to advertising first and then corporate just just out of curiosity and roles. Um, and beer was just honestly pure coincidence. I was, it was 2010 and I was at WPP and I was, it was like the beginning of digital. And I was doing things like taking CMOs on what I call sort of Disneyland trips to, to Silicon Valley. So we'd fight go to injuries and Horowitz and we'd go take them to Facebook and be like, this is an ad, you know, digital. Um, and I was frustrated by being able to, at, at advising, but not being responsible. And so I got a call from a recruiter on just the right day about, about a role at, at AD. 
um, and had the scariest interview of my life with, with the person who ended up hiring me. Um, and so now, nine years later, here I am. Oh, no, I gotta know. Talk about curiosity. What made it scary? They're just very, if you know people from maybe, you've met a bunch of my team today who are, who are I think, we're, my group's pretty chill, but, but in general, I think we have a reputation at AB of being sort of like aggressive, assertive people. And so it was just this very assertive, and he did the one of those like management consulting, like how many televisions are there in, in the U.S. right now? And I was like, I just want to help you make Budweiser cool and digital. <laughs> um, so it was, it was intense, but it, it worked out. Well, how many TVs are there? I uh, know, I don't know, a long time ago, a lot. A lot. Okay. The third less than COVID time. Pre COVID time. <laughs> right. Uh, thanks to Uber and some other things. So you. Um, you talked about kind of how you got to marketing, and you talked about how um, kind of what inspired you. But you've been really, really successful at it. This may have seemed to be a bit happenstance, but in fact, you've had tremendous success. And I just want to share a little bit of that. So when you led Michelob Ultra, it was the fastest growing beer brand, a beer brand in the U.S. at that time. In 2019, you were on Ad Age's list of women to watch, as well as Sportsman's Journal's most influential drivers. Um, and that's just like a snippet. There's a few others that are relevant, which is you launched Middle of Ultra Pure Gold, and it was the most successful innovation in the company's history. Um, you won some Can Lions and 13 pencils at the one show. So like all of that brain power applied to beer has led to tremendous success. What's the secret? Luck and hard work and um, I don't know, commitment, commitment to ideas. I feel... I mean, I'm, at AB, we're so lucky, right? Like I've made, um, before I switched to my current role, six Super Bowl commercials. Like who gets to say that in life, right? It's, it's incredible. Um, and so to be a part of working with, you know, the best of the best creative talent and the, having the resources to make the things that those creative talent recommend um, and, and, you know, having the incredible partners, you know, we're here for Super Bowl, like the incredible sports relationships that we have um, it's really just been about, you know, the ability to kind of hone in on on the things that we have access to and really push and fight for, for ideas that we believe in. I've made some really weird, not great things, too. Um, and just being OK with that and, and learning from, you know, learning from all those experiences. And I feel I'm super grateful for, for the recognition um, that I've received. But it's, I'm, I'm a representative of a team and much larger institution that's, that's helped in all those places. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned uh, that because, like, when you think about the team, you all involve yourselves in lots of them. Um, I think your title, of course, is Consumer <laughs> Connection, which is a big, broad title. But when you understand the specifics, it's even bigger than that. There's 200 or so partnerships that you all have in the space. Talk me about that. That's a tremendous what's your approach, like navigating a space that large. Yeah, so um, I have the great privilege. I lead a team of about 50 people. Um, and we are responsible for paid media across all channels in the United States, our sports partnership. So athlete team and we, you heard from my guys on my team, Joe and Matt earlier today, um, entertainment marketing. So anytime you see someone holding a butter Bud Light in television or film, um, and then the experiential activation of, of all of those. So for things that we sponsor or things that we prop platforms that we create ourselves, um, and it's incredible. So yes, there are 200 is, is just sort of the sports world and it gets even bigger when you think about venues and, and other things. Um, and we're organized this way because it's really about um, bringing together all of the places that our brands could touch and engage consumers in the real and virtual world. Um, and I say to my team, right, our, our mantra is sort of synergy, not silos. So you know, you could do, we could do a great media campaign, right? But it's that much stronger because Matt and his team have brought their expertise and understanding of our sports relationships and our sports partnerships to make that media by that much stronger. And then we can activate experientially because everybody sort of knows what everybody's doing and, and it's connected. Um, and the objective is to get more out of out of our relationships by having by having things um, connected, and also recognizing right that that because of mobile and digital all things that are happening, a consumer is not thinking about you know ooh I saw Nicola Ultra in a bar and it stood for this, and I was at a television commercial and I saw this. Their expectation is that we deliver a connected and unified experience wherever and however they interact with us, and so we're organized in such a way to try to deliver. 
to try to live on that. And it, you know, works better and worse in certain moments and times, but that's the, that's the intention. Yeah, I mean, it's brilliant to be cognizant enough to know that these things exist kind of independent activities, but if there's not a tie that binds, it'll be totally disjointed. And so part of the tie that binds these moments oftentimes are vision, strategies, you mentioned the mantra. Are there other sorts of uh, large overarching thoughts that you all bring to bear on that, that applies across not only the various segments, but also the many, many brands of portfolio that you have? Yeah, we, um, so again, just within, so our company uh, purpose, which is actually just relaunched a couple weeks ago, um, is, is AB InBev exists to create a future with more cheers. And so we we exist to to bring people together to create more joy, whether that's through connections through our products, the things we do in sustainability and environment and community. Um, and so when, within connections, um, my team, we we say that that we exist to sort of authentically connect our brands to people and the things that they love. And so everything that we do and everything that we create is, is this real and meaningful? Um, is it going to make a difference? Is it going to be something that people remember is again, the, the spirit behind everything that we, that we do. More cheers. More cheers. That seems simple, easy to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can get that with cheers. So um, let's speak then about um, Anheuser-Busch, the company. It's been around for, 150 years or so. It's based in St. Louis. There's 30,000 uh, teammates. Um, I got to ask about St. Louis really quickly. Um, this might be awkward, but I don't want it to be that way. There was a team called the Rams in St. Louis. It <laughs> happened to be playing a Super Bowl, but they're not in St. Louis. So it's a prevailing thought that we are like fans of the Rams right now, or are we like rooting against the Rams as a result of like uh, we we are very proud partners of both the LA Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals. And so what I've been saying to everyone is I am rooting for the commercials. Uh, well, done. Yeah. well done. Are you rooting for everyone's commercial or just your own? <laughs> I mean, mostly my own, but everyone's. Do you know how hard it is to make a Super Bowl commercial? Like, I just want to go to everybody who's got one and just be like, we made it. You got it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the street is from our friends in the NFL yesterday because there's some that are being worked on even today. I'm sure. I'm sure that the people who are pushing that trafficking deadline of February 4th down <laughs> to the second. Exactly. So, you mentioned so there's 30,000 folks across your, your company. Uh, you have been around for a long time, tremendous portfolio. Budweiser, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, Stella, Bush, Natty Light, Landshark, Hogar, Shark Talk, and some other extensions with light deep, beers deep and flavors and, and, and seltzers and all the things. Um, I'd like to understand more about kind of how you make decisions around so many brands. And before I get there, I want to understand like, what is a seltzer exactly? Because <laughs> I've been trying to figure this out. Yeah, I, so I am as shocked, well, actually, I'm not at that shocked about the hard seltzer phenomenon. I will never forget, I was in on a market visit somewhere in Louisiana when I was running Michelob Ultra, where Michelob Ultra does very well. And I was walking around the grocery store there with my sales team, and there were huge stacks of La Croix everywhere. Huge, 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 huge. And we had at the time bought a Spike Seltzer brand, it was a tiny little company in Maine or something. And the sales guy was like, I don't know why we bought this company, same thing. What is it? What's the point? And I go, you see that right there? He's like, yeah, I'm like that with alcohol. Like it's a huge phenomenon. It solves many problems, like particularly for, for female and younger consumers who maybe reject or, or are more hesitant in beer. They don't like the bitterness of beer. They don't like the carbonation. They complain a little bit about the flavor. So in seltzer, you have something that has just enough flavor that is low cal and low carb, depending on which kind you're drinking and doesn't cause the same sort of bloating that people complain about. Um, and if, on the other side, if you're a vodka soda drinker, it has that same sort of effervescence of a vodka soda, but with less alcohol. So then you can have more of them and not be concerned about being over consuming so much. Um, and you don't have to drop 25 bucks for, for a vodka soda. You can get a six pack of seltzers for, you know, $14. Worth. Um, so I, so I think it solves a lot of, pain points for people um, in beer. And I think that's why we've seen the kind of explosion that we've seen over the, over the past couple of years. Yeah, it's been remarkable. Like yeah. over it's the last few years, everywhere. everywhere you go, everyone's everyone got one. one. And it's like yeah. one thing to do. Yeah. The other thing that that's people true. like have exploded on recently seems to be these 
Cocktails like man. Yes. Tell your boy about that. <laughs> Cocktails in a can. Uh, with respect to my Diageo friends who are who are um, who are in the room, I think um, we also have a, a canned cocktail um, brand called Cutwater. Um, it is based comes from San Diego uh, that, that we acquired a couple of years ago, and they are delicious, award winning cocktails in a can. And it's this idea of just sort of the simplicity. You don't have to have mixers and bottles and extra things. Um, it offers all that all that you want. They're really good. It's easy. It's easy. It tastes good. It's easy. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Anheuser Busch is known for is like outstanding Super Bowl commercials. So you said you've been a part of uh, six of them yourself. Uh, I am not that old, but I'm also not that young. When I think back to the Anheuser Busch's like classic stuff, there's Clyde Dale's Kissing Puppies, which we all love and remember. There's um, Budweiser, the frog. <laughs> like, and uh, my favorite of all time might be Waza. <laughs> you like Waza? You're supposed to rock. Um, just watching Harry and having a bud. That was like <laughs> 20 years ago. Love that stuff. You have new hotness dropping this week. Um, are you willing to show us a couple of those? I think we have a couple. Sure, the Clyde sales are back. Um, as, as like Matt was talking about earlier, um, Budweiser sat out the game last year to, to sort of make a donation on to COVID awareness um, and COVID research. And so we had to bring Budweiser back. And there were lots of ideas about what to do and how to do it. Um, and then, you know, the, the brand team and the agency brought this, this great story. I think, you know, Budweiser stands for sort of American resilience and, and never giving up. And so just you know, a clean, feel-good story um, that I think people will be will be excited about. Seeing. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like you know a broken leg or injury and then having a, a puppy help you out. Um, <laughs> that said, teamwork, teamwork, like big animals, small animals, like we're all friends here. So uh, <laughs> that was really good stuff. I really, I told you, right? Coming back to puppies in the course of kids, baby. Um, well, let's go a different direction. There's another one we want to show. Uh, can we queue up another? Whenever you crack open a bush light, the mountain starts singing. It's cold and it's smooth and it's waiting for you. What is going on? Mountains of bush beer. Hit it, giant Kenny G. It's so smooth. Head for the mountains of bush. Like, like, admittedly, as an agency guy, I'm not supposed to laugh at anybody else's work. That's part of my contract. But that was yeah. <laughs> very nicely done. Um, tell us about that. Well, I think uh, two things. So I think one, in Super Bowl, you kind of got to swing for the edges emotion-wise, right? Everybody's bringing their A game. And so I think to stand out, to, to make people feel something, right? Whether it's a more intense feeling like the Budweiser or more lighthearted feeling like this one. Um, and Bush has done a great job. You know, it is kind of a workhorse of our portfolio, the, the value segment, um, and hadn't been in Super Bowl for, for a while and, and brought this great concept um, that we're actually airing regionally um, and in a few dozen markets in the Midwest um, where, where Bush is trying to expand and they're taking the, the uh, kind of classic Bush song and bringing in Kenny G. Um, but it's something I think is really interesting is that I think most people, when you think about a value brand like Bush, like we sponsor Bash Car and like deep sea fishing and stuff, 
you wouldn't, that's like a pretty multicultural commercial for what you might expect for, from Bush Light, which I think is amazing. And I think um, reflects part of, a big part of what we are trying to do as a portfolio is speak much more um, assertively and intentionally to the broader base of consumers um, that exist to consume our products, but then are also um, our, our relevant targets for, for what we're doing. There are lots of um, rural NASCAR loving black and Hispanic Americans um, that deserve to be reflected uh, in, in content. And so I'm super proud of the brand. I had nothing to do with the making of this, um, but I'm, I'm super proud of them for, for bringing that. Well, it's funny you mention that because like um, outside of noticing Kenny G, the super giant one, uh, which who doesn't know Kenny G? We all do. I did notice that exact fact. My first thought was like, huh, black people in bush light. I'm not sure I've always put those two together. Uh, even, so, even in Budweiser, right? The vet is yeah. an older black woman. Yeah. Like when you see older women in commercials, much less an older woman of color. So like we got a long ways to go, but we're, we're trying. I'm, I'm really proud actually. Of, of the <laughs> Uh, category it's almost like you up on my notes. Um, <laughs> diversity is a really important topic. We discuss it in all sorts of ways in the U.S. these days. Um, and when you think about it, there's 330 million Americans. 70% of them are of drinking age, as it turns out. 40% of them are people of color, and 51% are women. So as you are thinking about Bush Light or the Cool Hot Seltzer or whatever the other pieces might be, how does diversity? play into your thinking? How do you think about the strategy around uh, targeting markets or not targeting certain markets? How do you get your mind around diversity in the context of many, yeah, many beer brands and many segments? Yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, um, so it's really important to me personally that we do things because it's the right thing to do for the business as well as the right thing to do for the world. Like the last thing anybody wants to be is a token, whatever. I do not want to be anybody's token, anything. Right. Um, so, you know, we fully recognize um, the need to more broadly and effectively reach consumers of all types. Right. The, the next generation of 21 plus consumers is going to be more multicultural than ever. And so our ability to reach and engage them is, is quite frankly, a matter of survival. It's not like, a, oh, we should figure this out. Like we will have no future if we don't figure it out. Um, and I think that there is um, broad recognition of that in the, in the company, which is great. And so efforts on our part um, to make a difference, to, to try to think differently about how we are building content. We are also trying to use our weight and heft um, as an advertiser to try to make broader change in the industry. So for example, I believe that last year there were I think 87 Super Bowl commercials, of which three were directed by women. This year of our six, three are directed by women. So my, I pray, right? Others have taken a similar charge and like step by step by step, um, we'll all make a difference. But again, big realization, you know, a, a more when I was on the ultra roll of, of recognizing that like, I think people don't think that they have the power to make a difference, but like you actually really do have the power to say to your agency, I need a diverse list of production companies and directors, and I need the casting to look differently. And it's all just about not being afraid to ask. And I think as that happens more and more, more change will, will come. I love that. Um, you know, 72 Insight, we fundamentally believe that diversity is imperative. We've uh, mentioned this before in other forums that like, our mission is to expand and diversify the creative class. If you can do that, then you can have, you can provide diverse thoughts and insights to a marketplace that sometimes wants it and sometimes doesn't, but needs it just the same. So uh, I applaud your efforts there. You're clearly making tremendous strides. It makes a big difference. Um, so last piece, and then I want to open the floor for questions because I've asked enough. Um, what one piece of advice would you offer a modern marketer? Maybe someone who was you two years ago or someone who's you today just trying to figure out what to do going forward? What advice would you give? Um, I think it's I think it's the same thing I said at the beginning, which is which is just to be curious. I think that the world is changing constantly all the time. And I think the suit the more you start to get set in your ways like I know this and I know how to do this is like the beginning of the end. Right. Okay. And so just to stay um, open to, to new ideas and new things and, and new ways of, of learning and to look outside 
um, of the bubble that is marketing and advertising and look for inspiration in, in other places and spaces. Outstanding. Well, I have one more question, um, <laughs> but the audience may have some. Yes, absolutely. I'll totally take one. So I will run over here, Professor Kennedy. Thank you for having questions. Super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, of the six um, Super Bowl commercials that you've been involved in, what's your favorite? My favorite one uh, is one that we did with Zoe Kravitz and um, from a Global Ultra Pure Gold where we, we used ASMR and I got to have her do ASMR on a mountainside in Hawaii. It was incredible. I love that one. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, first and foremost, just want to acknowledge uh, something Damien said yesterday. Um, especially this being Black History Month, uh, really taking the time to acknowledge the contributions of Black creators, marketers. Um, as a young marketer myself, I, I once sat in a room like, like this and saw myself represented up on the stage. And it's something that even though the rest of the room looked nothing like us, it made me say, I can get there one day. So I want to acknowledge the importance of even just seeing you guys up here and give these insights. Uh, it's really meaningful, even though that's lost at the moment. Uh, my question, my question is similar to the other one. Six Super Bowl commercials is a lot of commercials. Uh, I'm curious as to throughout that process, what you've learned to iterate and make the processes better. What you've learned from each one to say, hey, next time we're going to do it better. Whether that's working with creative partners putting in processes that mitigate issues that you saw from previous ones, just interested in your learning. Yeah, I think um, for me, I think that the biggest thing that you need to get great work is trust between the client and agency. And it seems something, something so obvious, but at my first time out, I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate it. I think that, um, you know, it's the kind of work where there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions pulling one way or the other. And I think you have to really have that, like you and your creative director, or creative team are sort of in it and you're willing to fight for them for the things that they believe are really critical to the story. And, and then through that comes their, their flexibility on things that maybe need to tweak. You know, I need the poor shot to be longer than one second, guys, or I need the, you know, whatever. Um, I, I think that that that's something that I that I learned along the way, and like when there when there really is a real gelling between the team, I think that that's sort of when the magic um, can kind of happen. Um, and then sometimes too to not to like there are some things that I that I fell in love with that I knew were going to be weird and probably too hard to execute, but like we loved them so much we made them anyway, and they came out weird and too hard to execute. Um, and so like how do you you know how do you gauge when to um, like, uh, you know, not, not sort of fall too much in love with something that you lose the, the vision and kind of the business objective of what you're, what you're trying to create. Wonderful. Well, that's fantastic advice. And I think I, it's safe to say with six Super Bowl commercials, you're like the Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> you're almost there. You know? I need more, more rings. More rings. Yeah, you're almost there. We'll keep going. So let's thank these guys for, for sharing.